Welcome, welcome. Um, welcome to the lecture of Beate Hombach. Uh, I would like to introduce her. Beate is a leading figure in Norwegian architecture practice and education. She's a professor at AHO, the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. And together with Per Tamsen, she's the partner of Mente Cooler, an Oslo-based office that's situated at the intersection of art, architecture, and landscape architecture. As the practice is based in Norway, I think it's helpful to situate Beate's work in the lineage of Nordic and Scandinavian architecture, in the sense that I think when we look at Scandinavian modernism in particular, it arrived, historically, it arrived pretty late, you know, in comparison to, uh, late onto the world stage in comparison to other countries in Western and Eastern Europe. And I think a lot has to do with, um, or one of the many reasons has to do with uh, Scandinavia's embracement of uh, classicism, particularly uh, Nordic classicism uh, that delayed the arrival of modern architecture. But when it did arrive, it arrived with a more uh, refined and a matured form. You know, I think um, if we look at the early work of Anberg and Poulsen or Gunnar Asplund, uh, Sigurd Leverens or Alva Alto, uh, one way or the other, they all dealt with a certain type of uh, classicism or, or national romanticism or Jürgen Still or vernacular. Uh, but when they slowly evolved into modernism, I think the architecture that came out was already mature form, you know, has a certain quality. And, and I think because unlike the European counterparts, they were free from the imperative of being polemical or revolutionary. So in many sense, Scandinavian modernism, I think, benefited from this slowness of its becoming. You know, that resulted in this kind of evolutionary model of development. In many ways, I think Beate's own path towards becoming an architect reflects this ethos and lineage of Scandinavian modernism. She studied with Svea Fenn, Christian Norberg Schultz, two uh, towering figures at AHO, you know, in the sense that both Fenn's uh, integration of Nordic landscape and a particular light condition in his work, and Norberg Schultz moved from his earlier focus on an analytical uh, of psychological concerns on the alienation of modern life to a uh, phenomenology of place. I think that all could be traced in Beate's work. Um, uh, another person that Beate studied with was uh, John Haydock, which was close to VFN, and who in 1989 built a structure named Security on the Christiania Square that Beate was part of that team. And, and it's interesting that the, it was one of the first, it's the first built structures from Haydock's uh, victim series in Berlin that was built over time. Itself a very, involves a very slow process. It involves uh, two 30-year periods that all these victims will be built. But the one in Oslo was the first one. And in that work, I think it's part wall house, part uh, Trojan horse. One detects a certain zoomorphic or anthropocentric quality about the building and, and has a certain quirkiness and poetry that we can see in Beate's work. I think for Beate Hombach, I think architecture is about slowness, is about how things are made, about the act of making, whether it's drawing, writing, or sewing. It's about stories, it's about allegories. I think in a work you can detect a level of precision that's connected to culture. You know, so there's a building that's built like a ship in a shipyard in a land with an exemplary tradition in shipbuilding. You can sense a special attention paid to the site, although not in a mimetic way, you know, a approach to mimetic way to the site, but form a dialogue. I think some of the work you can see, particularly how it connects to the ground, it's both part of the land, but also uh, is uh, alienated from the land at the same time. Uh, I see uh, in her work a remarkable sensitivity, a willing, a willingly embracing a kind of irrational or ineffable aspect of, in, in the work. And so you see a structure that evokes uh, the best of a whale or a boat hull while being something entirely original in itself. Um, so through commission work and self-initiated work, I think Beate actively engages this notion of slowness and constructs an architecture of both fact and fiction. Uh, so I'd like to end by quoting uh, Svea Fenn in the conclusion of his acceptance speech in his 1997 Pritzker Prize Acceptance uh, Award, uh, which I think applies to the understanding of Beate's work. Svitz Fenn said, uh, my most important journey was perhaps into the past. In the confrontation with the Middle Age, when I built a museum among the ruins of the bishop's fortress at Hammer, I realized when working out this project that only by manifestation of the present you can make the past speak. If you try to run after it, you'll never reach it. 
But the great museum is the globe itself. In the surface of the earth, the lost objects are preserved. The sea and the sand are the great masters of conservation and make the journey into eternity so slow that we still find in these patterns the key to the birth of our culture. The title of tonight's lecture is, is Constructions on the Sites and Paper. Please join me to welcome Piate Homba. Uh, well, thank you for a very nice introduction, um, and thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. It is not only our work that is slow, it's also my speech compared to you. <laughs> you speak very fast, I would speak very slow, uh, but I'll do my best. Um, okay, we should start. Let's see if I can do this right. Some, some people wonder about our name. It sounds exotic. It is not. Manta is my middle name. Kula is my partner's old family name. So it's really just a common architect's office name. Um, <laughs> We have a small office. Uh, we are two partners, Pierre and I, and we have three employees. Um, we do different kinds of work. That's also why we like this name, which is sort of uh, a little bit not telling anything about who we are. Uh, we are very interested in making, as you said. We, we make models. We, we are interested in how things are put together. Um, we have, uh, we have um, all through our practice, we have done both paper projects and commissions. Uh, in this lecture, I will try uh, to uh, show a little bit of the paperwork. If there's time in the end, I will show a full paper project. But I will also show a little bit of some earlier work just to, to somehow um, try to show that there is a connection. We believe there is a connection in what we do in those kind of projects and what we build. Uh, so uh, I'll start with only one small uh, piece from this series, which is called the Virginia series. Um, the rest of the, or the lecture is built up, not chronologically, uh, its sort of main structure is actually such that it's organized into types of projects. Uh, the paperwork is sort of coming in here and there, and then there are um, projects that are sort of utilitarian or pragmatic, and then there are some projects that are more about landscape installations, and then there are some spaces. Um, but but first, uh, the Virginia uh, series. It is um, when I finished school, um, I started to work in an office, and I found it very um, disappointing. <laughs> uh, and I really wanted to to continue to develop architecture, sort of based on what I was interested in, questions I was interested in. It's a fantastic thing to be in a school and to do school projects because you can really just focus on on uh, that which interests you and try to to make it into a project. And this is, uh, that's a fantastic thing and I wanted to continue on that. Uh, as Mark said, I, I, I had spent some time in the US. Uh, I knew Haydock's work well. I had worked for Raymond Abrams and I, I was very sort of well, uh, I understood the value of that kind of work. Um, so after a while, back in Oslo, I wanted to develop a project and I, uh, um, started a project based actually on the, the essay by Virginia Woolf, a very famous essay called The Room of One's Own. And I got this idea that, uh, that I wanted to develop houses based on my interpretation of uh, female literary characters. Um, let's see, I can take this off. Uh, uh, it turned out it took many years to full or to sort of finish this project because I was working other places at the same time. Um, but um, that it's um, oh, whoops, sorry, I'm trying to find the laser. Can I get it back? No, I'll try the other one. Yeah, here. 
uh, it, the first house was a house for a young woman, then it was a house for a mother and child, then it was a house for a housewife. I know some people dislike that title, but that's really what it is. And then it's a house for a widow. Uh, I'll say a little bit about um, this one. When you, when you work with paper projects, there is no site, there are no clients, and there is no budget or regulations or anything. And it's really just about trying to establish a ground uh, where an architectural thought can thrive and grow. Uh, and that is what I found in this literature. Uh, we are still quite interested in literature, and we often turn to literature when we develop these kind of projects. Uh, this house was based on the story of a Norwegian writer called Olaf Dune. Uh, the story is about a young mother who is married into a family of uh, farmers, and her father-in-law is a real uh, bastard, and he ends, she ends up killing him uh, to save the family, and then she is turned in by her her husband. So she spent most of her time in in jail, uh, and the whole sort of story started to make me think about the role of the housewife, sort of an old-fashioned word, but of course the role of someone who is not having an active life of one's own, but who lives at the home and sees the world through the eyes of the family members. Uh, so this house is really a, an extremely closed house. It's a steel structure. Uh, there's no windows except in the rooms uh, of each individual uh, living in the family. So when it's a good atmosphere in the in the family, the, uh, there's a lot of light entering the entering the central spaces, which is the sort of uh, the world of the housewife. When there's difficulties in the family, when there's bad communication and people are not involving in each other's lives, uh, this central space becomes a very dark one. This. Uh, this was long before we started to draw on AutoCAD and machines. It's, it's a project very much about drawing. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, well, sorry, I'm messing up here. Uh, showing exactly this, the, the idea of, of the light coming through the, the individual spaces. Uh, very simple section, folded steel plates lined with solid timber and only, only very, very tall windows certain places. The reason why I, why I show only this house now, or only this project now, is because uh, when being invited for this lecture, I was asked if there was some connection between the paperwork and the built work, and, and of course there is. Um, not in the sense that, uh, that the theme of the project is the same. It's very different when you have a commission. But, but even in these projects, the unbuilt ones, uh, when, the, when the sort of narrative is established or the ground is established, when it comes to the tectonics or the structural working out of the project, we, it is very similar to the way we work with real projects. Uh, all these mm, projects were dimensioned by an engineer and sort of they could be built. And, and at that point, that was very important to me. Also, another thing which is, I think, apparent in the paperwork is that which we are also interested in, in built work, that structure has a sculptural potential, that, uh, that uh, the way we use materials and, and forms has to do with, with the structure of buildings, and it should somehow have a, a strong visual character. Um, okay, to the, to the first built project, this is actually the first project we built as an office. It is a generated chamber. As you probably know, Norway has lots of, um, of water power. Uh, and uh, and this uh, was a competition we won, we won back in 2007 or before even before that. Um, 
there was the topmost reservoir of a long line of, uh, of lakes running down to a deep valley where there was a power station. And between the top reservoir and the next lake, there was a dam built in the 1940s by the Germans. Uh, and then one, uh, the power company found out that if you if you built made a hole in that dam, you could exploit even more power. Um, and at that time, and it still is actually, when when um, when you build these kind of small power stations, you don't have to ask for building permit. And when they are built, they are very often built as sort of camouflaged cabins or houses, uh, one, one should sort of not um, make them look like industry, which they are, they are industrial buildings, but there's very little tradition for that in Norway, at least at that point they were. They were. Uh, so when we did this uh, competition, we were interested in trying to find a form or a way of, of solving this um, this project so that it actually could could tell what it was doing. Uh, here's the um, uh, just a, a sort of site plan, the dam, uh, and the, the new opening in the dam, and the turbine under here, and the generated cham chamber on top of it. As architects, we also could contribute to, to sort of the siting of this installation. We had the turbine turned and, and did quite a few things to, to lessen the impact on the existing uh, river and natural terrain. But what we were interested in as architects was, was the relationship between this new building and this existing dam. It was a very, even though it was a very pragmatic structure and the program for our building was also very sort of practical, uh, but there was something very beautiful about this long, long man-made li man line running through the whole landscape and to put the building actually on the, the sort of brief of the competition was to put a building connected to the dam, sort of as a growth out on the dam. And we really didn't believe in that. We, um, we were interested in making the building as something sculptural, uh, standing in front of this beautiful structure. Um, so we suggested a, a circular, a circle, circular building, <laughs> sort of showing the the movement of the generator, um, and that was what was built. Um, this is industrial building. I mean, the budget for these kind of projects is extremely small. So we developed. Uh, um, a system uh, of uh, prefabricated concrete elements that could all be made in the same form. So even though they are all different, they all have a different sort of angle at the top, and some of them have details built into the to the concrete form, but they are still all coming from one sort of one formwork. Um, what is also great with with these kind of large structural elements is, of course, that they can be erected very quick, quickly. In this place, you can only build during the winter, because in the summer season, you know, there's too much water in the river. Uh, so this, uh, the main structural sort of uh, wall of the building was elevated in only one day. Um, and there was, as I said, very little money. So that which of the building which was not made of these 15 elements was uh, um, just very simple structure uh, covered with spray-on concrete like they do in tunnels and road work. So you get this um, uh, very sort of coarse building which has simple details, all all details made in the form except the small roof of the of the door. Um, uh, and uh, the, there's no gutters or anything. This is a very sort of there's lots of stone and lots of uh, rock in this area. And and the idea here was that 
uh, as time goes by and water runs off this building, it will start to run down the facades and it will grow lichen and and uh, moss like it does on the old uh, old uh, dam wall. Um, so this is what it looks like freestanding from from the wall. Um, another project. Uh, also a very practical one. It's a restroom. Uh, it was the first project we did for the Norwegian tourist route, a project you might have heard about. It's a, it's a big state-driven project. Um, Norway is, of course, incredibly long, and in the north and in many places it's not very densely populated. So tourism is becoming very important, uh, and the road ministry has uh, does its, ch its share of um, of sort of uh, preparing for for tourism by car. Uh, so 17 stretches of, uh, of road has been selected to be sort of scenic routes, and along these routes, architects are invited to to do different kinds of projects. Uh, the first project we got was was a toilet, and it was up in the north, uh, in the Lofoten Islands, very beautiful site. And the reason why we we were invited was because this toilet, which was standing on the site, had been lifted away by the storm. Um, uh, this is a picture from the site at dusk. It's incredibly uh, powerful. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean is, is right outside. Uh, and when you drive through there, the, the nature can sometimes be uh, almost too much because the, there's so much weather and so much uh, water and so much mountains. And <laughs> uh, it's uh, very powerful. Um, so we had this idea that when 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 you have to stop to go to the toilet, maybe you should find something else. Maybe you should not see the nature. Maybe one should make a, a very closed building with no windows to look out on the scenic surroundings. Rather, it should be sort of um, directed towards the sky. So that you could get a break from the from the nature, but that the building itself could give you something else. We started out with a with an idea of a concrete project. This was just after the power station. Uh, but then, as Mark mentioned, we understood that there were uh, local mechanical industries or wharfs uh, quite nearby, and we started to look into the possibility of. Uh, of making this project in steel, uh, like so it could be sort of built locally and transported to the site. Uh, so we started to uh, to develop the project with a with an inside structure of uh, of ribs that could be covered in very very thin steel with a large skylight and a very a window high high up on the wall. We, when we work, we work quite close with engineers or with the, some engineers that we respect and like to work with. And uh, during uh, this process, uh, we found out that uh, you really don't need the in inside ribs. One can actually use this, the sort of skin of the building structurally, only, only sort of bracing it when it's really, really long or really wide. So, uh, so the building was made and sort of test welded together in this local wharf, and then transported to the site and well, well back again uh, there. It is. Um, Although this is, of course, a very sort of pragmatic building, with uh, it's not a um, heroic <laughs> program at all, but it's uh, um, that is fantastic with the national tourist route that you are actually given time to develop a project, uh, even though it's as small as this. And and for us, it became important to to uh, uh, to sort of work on the not to optimize the structure in any way, but actually to work on how 
the steel was used to, to give the building some sort of character. For instance, as an example, these, these um, flanges that were to hold the glass, they could of course have been parallel or rectangular, but, but to us it was very important that when you looked out to the sky, uh, out through these windows, it should not be like looking out of a square opening or a rectangular opening. The building should have an active role in a way, or the architecture should have a role, so, so we, we gave form to these flanges so that the opening changed, changed its appearance. <coughs> Uh, many uh, people believe that this building looks the way it does to mimic the, the, the site it's situated in, but that is not really the case. When we, when we saw these pictures, uh, we have a, actually an American architectural photographer friend who came and took this picture for us, and, and he saw this connection, and we were re really surprised. I think we, uh, maybe because of Christian Urban Schulz, or I don't know, maybe most architects think that way, that when when you have a site, the site is absolutely the most valuable sort of thing you ha you deal with, with when you when you are to build something. Uh, so to understand the site's character and to understand um, sort of the the atmosphere or the or the qualities in a site uh, is really what initiates the, the architectural ideas in a way. Um, but never mimicking. So, so this picture is a little bit strange, uh, strange for us. Um, uh, so this is what it looks like from the front. Uh, all the there is, of course, when you when you work with quartz steel here, the, there's eight millimeters uh, thick walls. They don't have to be so thick, but because this is standing right next to the salt ocean, you need a sort of two millimeters of sacrificial layer that can be that does not have to be structural. But quartz steel, anyway, is is uh, the problem with it is, of course, that you get dirty, that you can get rust on your clothes when you get close to it. So, so all the parts where you get close to the to the to the walls are uh, made in stainless steel uh, and inside we have also lined uh, the building or lined the walls with clear glass so that when you lean to the wall you don't get get dirty um, we like very much in this I guess in this project and in all our work we we are not at all sort of uh, super refined we spend a lot of attention or we pay a lot of attention to um, solutions but we like when things are readable and and direct in a way we um, so we we really like that we can still keep the notes that the steel workers wrote on the panels, or that we can see that the, that the youngest in the crew had to drill these holes for ventilation, and that it's really, really hard to drill through steel. Um, this is one of the interior uh, in pictures, and then another one. I, I said that we didn't want these people who came to this building to see the nature and we wanted them to experience something else and I guess that else is really the strong presence of the of the structure and of the of the sort of building itself. When, when we work, and I think that is also symptomatic for many architects, uh, we always try to sort of argue and try to find a logic line in our work that we do things because of this and this and this, and we develop this sort of linear logic. Uh, but in the end, uh, and that is of course needed because you need to argue, you need to tell clients why you do what you do, and and it it needs to be. Uh, rational and logic, but in the end we, we have found that that uh, there are really the, always some irrational aspects of the project which, which sort of become very important that we cannot argue sort of rationally for. For instance, in this project, we, it was uh, 
it was easy to argue for the clear glass, glass lining. But then when we were looking at the, at the model, we understood that when you were sitting down in this building and looking up, you could, if there was a reflective surface there, actually still see the horizon. So, so this is a, uh, it's a clear glass panel that is mounted. Um, yeah, maybe you, you see it actually up. Up here, you, of course, you can never come on that high up, uh, so there's no logical reason for this glass, only this, this understanding that when you look up, you could see, still see the Atlantic. Uh, another another um, um, pragmatic project, this is not for the tourist route project, but for the road ministry. Uh, it's a ferry port, uh, also up in the north, as you saw. Uh, this is a, one of the smallest municipalities in Norway, and it's, there's no road leading to this place, only ferries. Uh, so the, the sort of ferry dock is a very, very important place. This here has been a, a sort of a saloon, I guess you could say, or a sort of a uh, coffee shop and a place you could stay over when you were fishing uh, all the way back to the 18th century. Um, and the ferry has always landed on this dock. Uh, and with the increased tourism, uh, cars line up here on this uh, asphalt parking area. Um, it has turned out to be too small. The boats are becoming bigger and the cars are becoming mannier. <laughs> uh, so one had to build a new ferry stop. This was, of course, very problematic for, for the small hotel and, and coffee place and restaurant that was situated here uh, to, move the, to move the stop because then they were afraid they would lose cost customers. Uh, the new site for the, for the ferry stop was across the small bay. I'm now standing sort of almost on the old dock, looking across the bay to this beautiful tongue of land coming down here. You see the church tower in the back. Uh, and that was decided to be the new site for the, for the ferry stop. So we, this is, a, I guess, the, one of the larger projects we have done. It entailed a lot of landscape work, trying to, in, the plans from the road ministry um, was to, blow, to sort of blow away or, or fill this whole uh, beautiful tip of land. Uh, so we did a lot of work to sort of narrow down the traffic area and, and minimize the impact of all the very heavy road or sort of groundwork was, that had to take place there. Um, and then we, there was also an idea to blast away this rock here to build a service building in the mountains here or in the rock here. Uh, but we suggested to move the building to make it more part of the of the sort of technical technical part of the dock. Um, this place, uh, what was important in this task was of course to, um, to make a small building that should uh, take care of sort of waiting room and a kiosk and toilets and places to wait for the ferry. There's a lot of waiting included when you travel by boat in Norway. Uh, but also it was to, to make a building that would sort of hint that there was something happening across the bay. So, so the idea for this is, it was almost an intuitive reaction, uh, this structure, that it should be a structure that was about uh, spanning between, between two points, um, really being spanning across the bay, but also um, making almost like a portal or a, or a gate so that you could could see what was beyond the building. Uh, another much more much more sort of uh, um, I guess uh, intuitive uh, source for this project. Uh, Mark mentioned this whale. <laughs> And uh, there is something about the, the size of the building was almost exactly the same size as the blue whale. 
And also there was something about this um, closeness or relationship to the water and to the big ships, the hulls of the ship were these big bodies moving in water. So the, so the, the whole project was very much about finding a structure that could um, both um, uh, um, sort of hint or evoke the idea of of this uh, the importance of these big bodies, <laughs> uh, and also of course make different con uh, conditions for different kinds of structures underneath or spaces underneath. Uh, so this is a model of the of the project. It's. Uh, uh, it was important that you could see through, and it was to us. It also became very important that almost when you look at the, uh, at some uh, some uh, live uh, structure or animals or insects, it's always very beautiful when you can see through them and see everything that they are almost transparent. That you can see the blood and heart and everything. And and in this building, we really wanted everything to be transparent so that you could read every part of the building uh, and that is um, that is quite hard to do in Norway because the climate is such that, that in the winter it's really cold and you get condensation and all these kinds of sort of um, conditions that the building has to deal with and also it's facing south so we had to we had to have this sort of um, hang these volumes and make the whole building asymmetrical so that you would get some shade underneath these, these um, cantilevered or hung volumes. Uh, so this was the structure. Well, this is also a steel building. We have spent a lot of time building in steel. Uh, the only cast part are the two gable walls. Uh, uh, they have uh, one of them has uh, has this bulb which makes it stable. Uh, the steel roof is is 10 millimeter thick. Uh, what you see here is uh, light fi or structure holding a light fixture that runs through the whole building. Um, this is what it looks like in uh, uh, when it's built. It was a it was an enormous uh, contract for the contractor, uh, and it was, um, um, the big part of the contract was of course all the groundwork. So the contractor who was chosen for the job had never built a building before, and it was a really tough um, <laughs> process because uh, uh, this is of course all prefabricated except as in situ concrete, but to have someone who was used to blasting tons of stones away put together prefabricated steel elements was really, really difficult. Um, here you see uh, this idea of uh, seeing through the building, seeing across to the other side of the bay. You also see the, the sort of presence of this large inverted vault that is actually visible for, from every, every space of the building. Uh, and the building offers many places where you can stand when it rains or snows, uh, and you can stand and wait, wait for the ferry. Um, yeah, there you see the the light that runs through the whole the whole structure. It's um, it is of course a, a composite structure with with the. Uh, concrete gable walls carrying the very large uh, vault. And the vault, again, stabilizes these glue lamp beams uh, and, uh, and um, posts so that they can be very, very slender. Uh, and then there's insulated glass both in the ceiling and on the walls so that you can, from every space, you can look up into the steel structure and, and out so that you can see the ferry when it arrives. Um, even from the toilets, there's glass everywhere, except some of it is, is sandblasted, of course. Um, and then the, during the night, there's lots of dark, dark time in the northern part of Norway. So, so these light fixtures I talked about, this uh, lights up the, the vault so that it sort of works as a lantern during the night. 
Uh, I will um, I will show you some some more sort of interior project or spaces we have worked with. But before I do that, uh, I'll show a little bit of another paper project. Uh, this is a project we did some years ago. We were invited to to this exhibition in Rome for this Campo Gallery there. Um, and when we get these invitations, we always try to make a new project. Uh, for this. Uh, for this exhibition, we were given two words and two images. The words were hope and system, and the images, we were not told what it was, but we, of course, immediately recognized it. It was work by Walter Pichler, the Austrian architect and an artist. And this was sort of going to be the start of a project, and we could really do whatever we, we wanted. Um, what interested us was, um, uh, was this uh, co-living of two different things in both these drawings, or both the model and the drawing. Uh, this um, uh, two elements that are similar but not the same, that share something, and also these structures that are of a certain nature and that cohabits with this sort of immeasurable strange mass uh, that grows into it and we and we we thought that we would make a, a house uh, and that that house should somehow deal with um, the relationship between two people that uh, share something but not, don't really know of each other and maybe uh, maybe the house could could somehow um, be almost like an instrument of their life together, but not together. Um, another images of, uh, image of Walter Pichler's work. Um, what was the hope we had to deal with was, of course, this, uh, this idea that when you, uh, when you have this sort of not explicit relationship to another person, uh, there is always this hope or this, um, at least we imagine that there is this hope that it will become something else. Um, but we also had to deal with system. And um, uh, and in this project, we, we one can always say that architecture is sort of, a, it's order, it is about ordering things, it has to do with, with system, and of course it has. But in this project, we, we worked with system in another way. We, we made a description for this project that is built on the system of the Keatsian Ode, uh, this, um, this poetic system where uh, the stanzas are made out of uh, ten lines. Uh, and then there's a rule for how the different rhymes or lines should rhyme, that the first line should rhyme to the third, and the second to the fourth, and then the fifth to the seventh, the, the, well, the fifth to the eighth, then uh, sixth to the ninth, and the seventh to the tenth. <laughs> uh, so it was a project where that consists of um, a series of, um, it's, a, it's a story of a house with two inhabitants, and it's a story of waking up in the morning and passing through the house and leaving the house uh, the, into nature. So each, um, each uh, stanza is about sort of a, one of the floors in the house. Um, I think I'll read one of these stanzas for you. It's a little bit embarrassing because it's in English and now we are in America, but you have to bear over with me. The, the text starts with, uh, with one, uh, one verse called window, then there's one called table, then there's one called fire, then there's one called mirror, and the last one is forest. And I'll read, <coughs> read uh, the one which deals with this, oh, sorry. I'll go back. This is a section of the house. Actually, it's so hard to see in here. But there's a very, very thin mirror here. And it, it's sort of you wake up on top, and then you move through the house down. And this is where you come to this point. And 
this is a plan of exactly the same place where you have the two uh, the two sort of parts of the house. This is where they are at the closest. It's really just this thin mirror, a very very thin membrane dividing one one side and one life and one home and one person from the other side. And then the project was, of course, plans, sections, and illustrations, two illustrations mirroring each other, uh, sort of seeing the same place from two different perspectives. Uh, mirror, rapid run to a common point where independent systems meet and measure, separated and connected in a membrane joint. Reflected eyes give pleasure. Trembling surface, resonating footsteps in a stair. My image in the mirror standing still. Will you feel my presence when you pass? Sudden shivers and a scent of moss is brought by air. Silence kept by doubt and not by will. Cyclic life is calling through the glass. Um, yeah. It's always a little bit strange just showing a little bit of a project, but, but since this was, was about paper projects, I thought it was interesting to, to have them throughout the lecture. And it would be too long to talk about all of it. This project uh, is uh, done in Oslo. It is, as I said, a space. Uh, it is an ode. Ode to Osaka is the name of the project. It's really an ode to Sarifian. Um, uh, we were invited by the Museum of Architecture to do actually a big model of one of Sarifian's unbuilt work for a sort of summer exhibition. And I, I have a really hard time with uh, architectural exhibitions because very seldom or very rare do they give you an architectural experience. It's always uh, you see fantastic models and fantastic drawings and and nice photographs and all of that, but but seldom does it actually give you a feeling of architecture. And we thought that this project, which is Sverdefien's entry for the competition for the uh, Nordic Pavilion at the Osaka World Fair in 1970. Uh, this is a project that all of those who know Fian's work knows this work, this project, um, because of its sort of strange character. It's not like anything else he has done. Uh, but we were very sort of keen on exploring this, this uh, space that he was after. Um, Osaka was at that point the sort of center of uh, the sort of uh, positive industrial evolution. <laughs> One had very much faith in uh, in uh, uh, the development and inventions uh, happening in uh, in modern in technology and industry, and and that World Fair is quite interesting. And there's lots of interesting architecture there, and it's always quite optimistic. Sverdefian's project was dif different. He proposed this lung, or these two lungs, that somehow would be connected and that they should be reminders of clean air. And, uh, and he had this idea that inside this lung, one should uh, project images of untouched nature, but also nature that was uh, spoiled by... Um, by waste and pollution. So it was a, a sort of a, some years before, before others, he, he sort of predicted this um, uh, pessimism that is connected to industry, industrial waste. Uh, and he never, he of course didn't win the project and it was, it was never built. Um, uh, what what existed of materials for us to use was was it was only the competition entry. It was some boards with some very sort of loose pencil drawings, and then there was these fantastic model photos of Fian and his his employees testing uh, condoms. It was sort of uh, inflated condoms that they tried to push 
push and pull <laughs> to make them breathe. Um, the Architectural Museum in Norway is, is Sverdefjern's last work, the renovation of the old bank building, which you see around here. And then this pavilion, new pavilion, that he built uh, as his final work. Uh, the pavilion looks like this. It's a hard place to exhibit because it's uh, full of daylight. Uh, but we thought it was a very beautiful thought to to build a sort of interpretation of this uh, textile work in this concrete pavilion. Uh, in the competition, competition boards, there were also some, some pictures of, uh, of a model they had made. But uh, it was never explained, or I don't think it was solved, how, how these two lungs, the top one and the bottom one, were going to, to co-work. <laughs> how it was going to, to function. So we, we um, quite soon in the process, uh, started to collaborate with uh, a Swiss guy who is a specialist in sort of inflatable structures. Uh, and we, uh, we um, started to test how, how it could be done. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, that's science at all. It's quite straightforward, but, but to us it was a new world. And, and what was the most important thing, which was sort of laying over us the whole time, was that I had had Sverdefjern as a professor when I was at school, and, and I had tremendous respect for him. And, uh, and to sort of fiddle with his project was really hard, <laughs> because we, couldn't, uh, we felt that we could not uh, disappoint him even though he had been dead for quite a while. Uh, so for instance, um, inflatable structures are very often glued or taped. For us, it was important that every piece of the craftsmanship was well done. So we decided that the whole pavilion should be sewn. Um, and we also did tests in Zürich how the two, how the two um, lungs should collaborate. Uh, and then we also had to design this um, this um, uh, what do you say locker building in a way or or air lock because like with all inflatable structure you can of course not leave the door open too long. The, uh, uh, we always make a point of saying that this is quite different from the side of the project. Uh, we had to work in a circular space, in a square pavilion, and, and, uh, and we had to sort of interpret um, both the size and the techno technology and the, and the sort of uh, how he might would have thought about it if he were to build it now in a different space. Um, so we tested a lot with the different materials, both with the sewing, of course, but also uh, with what sort of wood we were going to use, how we could make a floor, how we could make uh, hinges for the doors, etc. We, we ended up using, using ash wood. Svarifian never used ash. He always used oak or pine. But we thought it was important that this project was sort of only a guest in his, in his building. Uh, we collaborated with a with a boat builder to develop this fiberglass floor, and then the 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 whole structure was made in this uh, Swiss uh, textile, which you see here, and then certain parts were were fiberglass to stabilize the stabilize the structure. Uh, then we dismantled every electrical. Uh, uh, armature in the building and erected this, uh, this inflatable structure. Um, from the outside it looked like this uh, and then from the inside it looked like this. Uh, we were also curators for this exhibition or co-curators and, and we, for us it was important that it was not going to be shown anything on these walls. Uh, by now, uh, sort of sustainability and a care for a sort of green, uh, green approach to architecture has become the sort of 
that's the way we have to do things now. So that is not so, so in a way, interesting in itself. However, space, pure space or pure spatial experience have become very rare. So we thought that the imp most important thing we could do here was to only have this empty space where, uh, where you could experience this, the, the top of the lung actually coming down and breathing like you were inside the, a large breathing space. Um, we also designed the bench so that you could actually spend some time there. Uh, it is made in black steel. Um, we thought it could be quite beautiful with this incredibly light space that where the black steel could be almost like calligraphy in this white white space. Um, It was actually quite beautiful because there was only daylight and because there were only glass windows in the in the pavilion, you could really spend time here and the and the character of the space would change tremendously depending on the how the sun and the trees outside were were acting. Um, now a, a, a small project that is quite recent. Uh, uh, it is called Stella's Room. Uh, it is built on a farm, uh, uh, not not far from the Fian Museum. Uh, the farm is from the 17th century. Uh, it's owned by a Norwegian artist. Uh, he bought it in the 80s, uh, and ever since he bought it, he has collaborated with a, a great Norwegian architect called Are Vesteli, and together they have done different sort of installations and alterations of the farm buildings. Um, uh, this is the owner, Knut Woll, standing by one of his timber sculptures. Um, uh, and, and this farm is, of course, there's lots of, uh, of log structure there. Uh, uh, so th this is in the barn building where he has his home and his uh, studio. Um, and here you can see one of Are Vestelis drawings of the of the of the barn, which is only one of the few buildings on the on the site. Uh, you see the log structure, uh, the studio, a small gallery, another gallery, and then uh, Knut's apartment here. And and uh, three or four years four years ago, Knut got his first first child, and by that time, Are Vestli had died, and uh, we were asked to design a room for this child in the garage here. Uh, what we what we found was. Uh, as I said, the whole barn is, is really a, a quite straightforward log structure, but this garage had been used for drying, drying grain and, uh, and storing equipment, so it had a different, much more open structure. Uh, on the outside it looked like the former picture, on the inside it looked like this, uh, and it had really some quite beautiful uh, sort of timber structure, as you can see in this model here. Really very slender and, and, and quite beautiful. Um, so we, uh, we did this small room behind the big, one of the big barn doors. This is existing barn door. Uh, so when you open, you start to see the new, the new space. Um, it's a very simple space, sort of uh, spanning between the, the log wall on one side and then this uh, timber wall on the other side. And we thought that it would be beautiful to see these timber structures from inside the space. So this wall is, is, is pure glass. Um, but this space is really most about light because since we were working behind the big barn doors, um, we had to find a way to get light into this. Uh, uh, so we worked with with a skylight, uh, and of course there's also glass uh, that is exposed when the barn door is withdrawn. Um, 
uh, and we worked with these how to meet the how to meet the exterior and how to bring the light into the space with these curved curved surfaces. Um, this is a skylight above her bed, uh, so when she wakes up in the morning, she she can look. Now she's still very small, but she can look up into into this space, which we think is a very nice way to wake up uh, and to start to to see different forms. The fantastic thing about not this project, but this whole farm project, is that there has been such such short distance between ideas and and realizations. It is as if this whole place is really about about having an idea and, and um, realizing it uh, very directly. So then a couple of uh, landscape, more sort of landscape projects. Another tourist route project, uh, fishing bridges at, also along the Atlantic coast. Uh, this is the shortest of these tourist route roads. It spans uh, across islands or skerries, uh, and it's a quite beautiful ride, but it's also quite um, exposed to weather. Um, um, uh, we were asked to, to look at this stretch of the road. Uh, because it had it had a very special uh, condition, and that was that. Uh, well, one thing was, of course, the, the the weather. Whatever we had to do there had to be dimension dimension for a wave height of 14 meters. As you can see, the the waves are really sort of uh, going above the above the road. Uh, but more important is that exactly this little stretch of road was a very, very good fishing spot. So people stop. This is sort of the main road leading around, uh, along the coast. And what happened was that people stopped their cars and started fishing uh, in the middle of the road. And of course, when they got fish, they forgot that they were standing on the middle of the road and they started to back out. And, and that was very uh, dangerous. Uh, so, so our project consisted in um, making sort of uh, almost like pavements or can-delivered pavements on each side of the road so that you could be stand safely uh, when you were fishing. Um, what we worked with here was, was really the, uh, the curvature of the landscape or of the road running through the landscape. Uh, uh, so we we worked with with these um, circular segments that would add to the to the road. We also had to enlarge the parking area. Uh, so we we used uh, we proposed we didn't do it ourselves <laughs> uh, to diamond cut the existing rock there to to get some space alongside the road. Um, that is this. <coughs> Uh, and then you had, you have the um, the bridges, uh, which had to be can't delivered away from the road in case there was accidents on the road. One should not be hit if one was standing there fishing. So it consists. It's about 80 meters uh, stretch. This and and this consists of um, sort of prefabricated elements that are exactly the same and that are mounted uh, on site on very very big steel uh, steel beams mm. uh. yeah and then on each on each end, you have sort of different end points for those who do not fish, so they could even go down on the scary and or sit and wait for the for those who are fishing. And as you can see, it's um, you maybe think that all we do has to do with curves, and it hasn't really. But but there is something very beautiful in the in the way the lines move in this landscape. And a, a project, recent project, also a rest area up in the north, uh, in Lofoten, this too. An existing place which has a very 
beautiful situation, but uh, but to, uh, until now you couldn't see anything because it was really uh, grown, uh, overgrown. Uh, so when you came there, you couldn't really see the sea or you couldn't see the, the fantastic nature around. So we suggested a new, a new plan, uh, taking away everything that was there and then making this large platform uh, from where you could look at the view. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a structure in steel and concrete, like everything else we do, uh, with the idea of, of s concrete foundations that would be almost like like carpets for the furniture. Uh, and then between these, one could span steel and fill with gravel and asphalt between them. Um, uh, so there you see the structure before the furniture came. In this project, we really spent a lot of time working with the furniture. Uh, because when you come to such a place, or at least our experience is that when you come to a rest area like this, you really want to find your own place. <laughs> uh, and we thought it would be nice on this big platform to, to make a series of, of furniture that offered uh, sort of specific places. Uh, so we, we started to test uh, how we could use standard steel or standard flat steel and form furniture. Um, in a simple way, or rather simple way. So we, we came up with a system of um, of elements uh, consisting of um, uh, of tables or benches that were connected to the railing because it was quite steep. You could fall out if it was if you uh, if you didn't have a railing. But we wanted to to find a system where where the railing could not stand on its own and the furniture could not stand on its own. I do think we work quite a lot with these sort of self-imposed constraints that we put ourselves or give ourselves a task. And the project, like in the ferry stop, it was about translucency or transparency. And, and here it was really about having a, um, a structure that was dependent on, on each other in a way. Uh, we also thought that that these uh, table and benches they should uh, should have some character, so we so we started to look into patterns, and and how how a pattern can act could start to tell the story of the structure. All these tables have only, or benches have only two legs, and the third leg is always part of the of the railing. And if you draw lines between these structural points, you started to get a very interesting graphic quality of of the sort of merge or mix between these curved surfaces and the and the triangles of the structure. Um, so we did. Also did some testing in in the office where we, uh, for the first time, started to use color. Uh, and we thought we could make these steel troughs that could be filled with epoxy. We thought with in the beginning, and during experimentation, we thought we found out it had to be polyurethane. Um, so we did this. Each table or each bench is is different. Uh, it's the the color scheme is that of the semaphore system. So it's. It's a sort of known known color scheme, um, and then we did tests uh, with how this could this could be made, uh, and this is what it looks like. It opened last or this fall, um, and it's uh, yeah, it is what it is. We really like the fact that this polyurethane is so incredibly shiny. So when you're here, even though there's rough weather, you always get these reflections of the sky in the in the in the surfaces. Uh, is there still time? Do you want to see another project, or are we running out of time? No, it's, it's fine. Yeah. Um, so this is another paper project again, and uh, this time I will show you uh, most of it, or the whole project. Uh, 
a couple of years ago, we were invited to to do a project for the uh, for a museum in France, the uh, Centre Frac in Orléans. Uh, they were going to have their first Biennale. That was one thing, but what interested us was that they have one of the largest collections of experimental architecture in Europe. It's a very, very interesting collection. Uh, and, um, and we were asked to develop a project. Uh, and the theme for the Biennale was walking through someone else's dream. And we were really given free hands of how to deal with that. Uh, and we started to to think about, well, it, we thought it was a strange and quite evocative title, uh, uh, but we, we we kept asking ourselves, whose dream are we walking through? We have to find find uh, someone to work with here. Uh, so we 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 searched for sort of a protagonist or a series of protagonists that we could could work with, and, and started to think of um, who. Who dreams, and for whom are dreams important? Uh, and and that led us to think about people in isolation. That when you are isolated, uh, the dreams are probably uh, a very sort of important input in your life. <laughs> Uh, and then we started to look for for people uh, across the globe and across history that have been isolated for different reasons. Uh, and and we, as I have said before, we give ourselves constraints. So in this project, we said that we have to find characters that real characters that have been isolated on islands because that is the sort of most isolated you can be. Um, and then we we said that from the narrative or from these brief stories of these people, we want to develop some architectural ideas. Uh, so the uh, the here are the five islands that we ended up with. Uh, the first character is an Icelandic arson in the 11th century who who was um, outlawed lord and who took refuge on an island where he lived for five years until he was found and killed. Uh, this is uh, San Nicolas Island outside California where there lived a tribe of Native Americans and the tribe was removed in the mid 19th century uh, they were removed and to the f to mainland by um, by um, what do you say christians <laughs> but they forgot to take one of the w uh, one of the women so she was left on the island and lived on the island for about 30 years until she was found and brought to the mainland where she dies died very quickly uh, uh, the oh sorry uh, this here is uh, Solovets Island up in the White Sea in north of Russia. Uh, this it's a large island and it was used as a um, prison and and uh, work colony for for uh, yeah for centuries by Russians. And here. Uh, 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 Ukrainian Cossack was moved. He was a diplomat and a general uh, during the um, uh, mid 19th century wars and uh, and was or early 19th century wars. But he fell out with the empress and and was moved here and uh, lived there until his death. Actually, in uh, well, he stayed there for many 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 years. Uh, and then it's a small. A uh, small island, North Brother Island, uh, outside New York, outside Manhattan, uh, where this Mary Mellon, this Irish cook, was interned in two different periods. She had uh, typhoid fever, and when working as a cook, she, uh, she of course, um, uh, spread this disease. She was never sick herself, but she she spread the disease, and uh, and she was interned here and and uh, died of pneumonia uh, after many years on this small island. And then it was um, this large uh, 
Asuncion. It's called. It's in the middle of the Atlantic. In the 17th century, there was a Dutch sailor uh, who uh, was found out in the middle of the Atlantic that he was homosexual, which was, of course, illegal at that point. So he was set ashore on this island um, where he... Uh, there was really no one else there, and uh, he died quite quickly, but he left a diary which was found by British sailors 100 years later. So these stories of these five characters became sort of the basis of, um, of the project. And then we had other constraints. We, um, we were given some leftover Canadian oak, which was very, very beautiful. So we said that all the sites for the project should be made in oak. And then we said that the dimensions of the site should be one unit of a measurement that was used in the, at the time of the protagonists uh, in scale 1 to 20. Uh, so we, we started out really making these, uh, these sites, you can almost call them. Uh, and another, oops, yeah, another constraint was that each project should be developed on one sheet of one large sheet of uh, watercolor paper and drawn by hand. Uh, so this is the first, uh, the first project uh, um, building from G. We call it. Uh, it's based on the Icelandic Icelandic uh, guy. This is the site. Um, the, uh, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, it's, uh, these projects are really about sort of uh, trying to define a, a, a theme or a topic that can be dealt with uh, with architectural means. Uh, and, uh, and doing this, we speculated, of course, about what these people were dreaming of and how that could be turned into to space. And for the Icelandic arson, we thought there must have been dreams of fear and freedom and a need to be in control. And the project is about sort of a cave and the cardinal directions for having control. This is a plan. Uh, these are not houses. They are not buildings for these characters. They are really just ideas of space. Um, I'll don't have to say so much about them. I can just go through them. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I guess the cave and the cardinal direction says it says most of it. Uh, it's central space and then these four vaulted spaces pointing to each direction. This is uh, the Native American. Uh, project, <laughs> um, another kind of site. We it, we also tried to make the sites, although they were made from the same material, we tried to make them in different ways. Um, she was left alone and probably missed her tribe, uh, so we thought there must have been dreams of inclusion and persistence. And the project is about nine rooms and 14 gardens. There was this thought that uh, uh, there could be company and comfort in the structure of the building itself. Um, the beginning of, of the project and the final model. <coughs> and it's the Ukrainian Cossack, Pyotr. There must have been dreams of friction and a feeling of gratefulness. He became, uh, by the after many, many years, he was offered to be released and to move back to Ukraine, but he decided to, to live on. He became a monk on this, on this island. Uh, dreams of friction and feeling of gratefulness, the gravity and the cross. This is a structure, it's sort of a, not very complex, but a sort of intricate um, timber structure, um, <coughs> joining and separating two, two sides. Uh, 
and the cook. She was, uh, as I said, she was never sick herself, so, so she always refused to to be moved, and she didn't. Um, she was very concerned about the fact that she was well, and uh, and one couldn't see anything on her that she was a carrier of this disease. Uh, so there must have been dreams of normality and a concern about surface, uh, the incline and the level this is about. Um, in this project, we used color. It was a sort of way of, of dealing with surface. Um, and the idea of normality was, of course, relating to the to the incline. And then this was the sailor. There must have been dreams of acceptance and a yearning to surrender in the horizon and the vertical dimension. He had this idea about a space that was elevated, uh, steel structure, uh, one space suspended or one circular space suspended from another circular uh, structure, leaving a gap and a view and then being erected above this site of um, walk, um, where you could uh, be, of course, inside the space, and also inside the space, and also continue up and and uh, lay on this large membrane roof facing the sky. Um, that was the last of these projects. It's, um, it's. Uh, I think that uh, that these kind of paper projects, are, as I started out saying, they are very important for our our practice. One thing is the sort of formal exercises they represent, and the sort of ideas about material or sort of tectonics, and they represent. But I think the most important sort of aspect of all these paper projects is that they have to do with um, empathy of some sort, of trying to to understand how uh, how the lives of people are and how architecture somehow can reflect that life. Uh, I have a small appendix in this project, which is in this lecture, which is um, a project we are working on now. It's a very, very difficult project. It is the memorial of uh, the Utøya terror uh, attack. We are doing it together with a landscape architect, a Belgian landscape architect, Bas Smets. And we are working on it now. And uh, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd just show you a few sketches. Uh, this is sort of not public at all, so uh, so it's really it's really just sketches. But the reason why I show it, I think, be, because I think it has a lot to do with with actually the archipelago project and all the paper projects, because it has to do with uh, with trying to give a form to something that is not um, uh, tangible. Uh, you probably have heard about the, the terror attacks of 2011 in, in Norway, where a Norwegian right extremists first blew up the government quarters and then um, took his car uh, up to this island outside Oslo, where the labor youth had their summer camp. And he dressed himself as a policeman. and. Uh, took the ferry across the lake and went around the island shooting 69 kids in their heads. Uh, there has been many, or there has been attempts on making a memorial for this project, but it's uh, one, one attempt was stopped and, and now we are working on a new one, which is going to be placed here on the, on the shore. Where the, from where the ferry leaves, and from where many of the survivors actually swam, uh, and were swam ashore, and also where 
um, where the injured people were were taken ashore and given medical help. Um, it's really hard to to start such a project. I, I will not show anything of the of the site or of the the whole situation. It is still under discussion, but uh, but it's some uh, it's an example of how a narrative or how a, a sort of something in uh, uh, connected to a story can be used to give form. Uh, since it's a national memorial, it is it is of course important that. In a hundred years or in a long time, this place should still remind people of the gravity of this incident. Uh, and how do you do that? How do you how do you build something that speaks to people about the cruelty of uh, of these attacks? Uh, and and these these are just sketches, as I said. But um, this is one way of, of uh, approaching the task. Uh, starting to look into the the timeline to the to the uh, to what actually happened um, when he started out blowing the government quarters up uh, and eight people were killed when he moved up to to the island and the time passing while he walked across the island uh, to different places on the island. Uh, uh, killing groups of people in in the separate separate places. Uh, if you look at the numbers and the and the places, you you get a, a sort of a list of of eleven spaces. Uh, the government quarter, by the main house, outside the cafe building, at the tent field, inside the cafe building, at the love path, in cliffs and water, in the forest. It's east of the school building, at Bolshevika and Stoltenberge, by the pump house and at the southern tip. Uh, we, uh, we have this idea of, uh, of making 77 stones, uh, placing them uh, uh, or organizing them according to spaces, uh, creating um, creating uh, groups so that they are not alone and so that uh, uh, on one side you get the memory of the of the victims and then on the other side the the stones could be formed to give place for the histories connected to the incident and you get the side where you have the flock those who were together and were killed and the the much harsher side of the of the story itself, and you get the, uh, this structure that somehow can deal with light. It's uh, one side towards the lake and one side towards the the rock, but maybe the light from the lake can penetrate the structure, and maybe also it can be a very nice place to, uh, yeah sort of commemorate those you've lost. Thank you. I think we, uh, we went over time, so we don't have any time for questions, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, I have to say, I think I think in one's architecture career, whether you've been in architecture for three years or thirty years, I think once in a while there are these rare moments where um, one is reminded why one wanted to be an architect in the first place. And tonight was one of these moments uh, for me, and I hope for many of the, of, of our students. So thank you again, Beate. It was really truly beautiful. <laughs>